Olá, sejam bem-vindos à Abralim ao vivo, Linguistas Online. Hello, welcome to Abralim ao vivo, Linguistas Online. I am Márcia Machado Vieira, a professor at Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. I'm particularly glad to be here to mediate a lecture that outlines some important areas of the cognitive discourse analysis field uh, and that deals with the connection of discourse phenomena with basic cognitive proce uh, process and that traces a multi channel approach to discourse. I'm glad because this field is especially important to the research orientation that I and also Max Wiedmann from State University of Rio de Janeiro are designing to some Brazilian user-based investigations we are in charge. And of course, it's an honor to collaborate in such a wonderful series of talks in this virtual event designed for the exchange of ideas organized by the Abralim Linguists Association in cooperation with important associations as Permanent International Committee of Linguists, Latin American Association of Linguistics and Philology, Argentine Society of Linguistic Studies, Brazilian Association of Applied Linguistics, International Association of Applied Linguistics, Linguistic Society of America, the Linguistic Society of Europe, Linguistics Association of Great Britain, British, British Association of Applied Linguistics, Spanish Society of Linguistics, and Australian Linguistic Society. We thank all these associations and the Abraham team for this great idea. Today, we are going to listen to Dr. Andre Kubrick, professor at Moscow State University. Dr. Andrei Kibrick is professor of the Department of Theoretical and Applied Linguistics at Philological Faculty. Uh, he, he is head of the Department of Typology and Area Linguistics, director of the Institute of Linguistics, head of the Center for Cognitive Studies, member of the European Academy, member of the Presidential Council of the Russian Language, Some of his ongoing projects and research interests are the varieties of Russian language, a grammar of an endangered language of interior Alaska, whose descriptions from phonetics to discourse structures uh, include sociolinguistic, ethnographic, and historical perspectives on the community. A multimodal approach to discourse which attempts to estimate the contributions of the verbal component, prosody, and the body language to the integral process of discourse production and comprehension, and to explore experimental methodology. The linguistic uh, system of discrete, non-discrete elements. So uh, he is all, uh, also the author of the book titled Reference in Discourse, published by the Oxford University Press. He is writing now uh, two textbooks, one in discourse analysis and other on the topic of languages of the world and language areas. He is the editor-in-chief of the project of the Encyclopedia Languages of the World. The title of uh, Dr. Andre Kubrick's lecture is Cognitive Discourse Analysis. Sure that we are going to enjoy it. I would like to invite the audience to write down questions, uh, the chat, no? write the questions that, down the chat during the lecture. Dr. Andre Kubrick, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, well, thank you very much, Marcia, for this uh, introduction, and uh, thanks the organizers for thinking of this um, excellent initiative. It's really uniting linguists around the world. And, um, and now I am, I am going to start my presentation. I hope you can see it, All right? Uh, Yeah, this uh, slide includes the logo of the Institute of Linguistics, Russian Academy of Sciences, which is actually my main affiliation. Okay, now uh, straight to my talk.
topic, cognitive discourse analysis. Uh, there are two most basic functions or realms um, of language. Uh, if you want to use a um, computer metaphor, uh, there is the offline realm, which is the organization of knowledge in an individual mind or brain. And uh, the other one is the online realm that is sharing thoughts across two or more minds or brains. I think these are two most basic functions. And this difference is similar to the difference between anatomy, static structure, and physiology functioning in real time in biological sciences. And uh, of course, both are very important. Both are fundamental and cannot exist without each other. Uh, cognitive linguistics, a fairly well-known intellectual enterprise during the last decades, originally evolved um, as um, a field studying mostly offline phenomena, such as lexical semantics, conceptualization, grammar as a system of principles and so forth. And uh, that uh, offline orientation somehow implied that discourse processing um, is, so to speak, less cognitive than, for example, long-term storage of lexical items. And uh, um, this is, I don't think this is uh, correct. And uh, against this background, I have been developing what I call cognitive discourse analysis for over 25 years now. And uh, I see this lecture as a chance to present that research to international audience. Um, in the recent years, this line of uh, thinking is paralleled by some other trends in cognitive linguistics, which is changing, of course, uh, and now also recognizes uh, the value of online phenomena. And I cite several studies um, on this slide. There was, in particular, there was a special issue of, of the journal Cognitive Linguistics a few years ago uh, that addressed some uh, online phenomena in the cognitive fashion. Uh, in this lecture, I will try to demonstrate that uh, uh, cognitive linguistics can and should embrace discourse phenomena, not just offline phenomena. And uh, simultaneously, discourse analysis as a field of study can and should be done uh, or explored in a cognitive fashion. And uh, also, I believe that this kind of approach uh, contributes to a more general agenda, understanding um, general cognitive processes, uh, uh, the human mind in general, uh, which is explored by a range of different disciplines. Uh, what do I mean by cognitive? What do people me mean by cognitive, the cognitive approach? There is a well-known uh, and nice formulation by George Lakoff, uh, what he called the cognitive commitment a commitment to providing a characterization of general principles for language accords with what is known about the brain and mind from other disciplines. And uh, it has been pointed out more than once, for example, by Dagmar Diviak, that uh, this commitment must be taken uh, seriously. So cognitive linguists really need to know what uh, specialists from the neighboring disciplines think and know about um, the brain and the mind. Uh, at this point, I also want to quote my late father, Alexander Kibrik, um, a Russian linguist who, who was uh, kind of originating the cognitive uh, uh, paradigm in Russia. And he said that at the foundation of the contemporary cognitive approach to language, there is an idea of a focused reconstruction of cognitive structures on the basis of overt linguistic form. Um, the linguistic theory of discourse, uh, no matter whether it's uh, cognitive or so linguistic in its, in its orientation or something else, um, needs to be briefly introduced at this point. Um, in, term, in terms of linguistic theory of discourse, uh, discourse is understood as a 
as a combination of two things. Uh, the process of communication between two or more individuals, plus the resulting product, that is the text. So uh, this course is uh, both dynamic and, um, and uh, also includes text as a result of these dynamics. And uh, I see discourse analysis as a part of a layered system of linguistic disciplines, uh, dealing with uh, constituents of various sizes from the smallest size such as phonology and then progressing to larger units, morphology, syntax, and finally discourse. Uh, so discourse analysis is a part of this layered organization of our science of language. Uh, there are three central issues or central domains that are exploring discourse analysis. Uh, and these include, um, th these domains are basically the same as in any natural science. Uh, you have to answer the question in what kinds of the object you are interested in occur. And this is uh, what can be called discourse taxonomy, types of discourse. Then there is a question of how is this object organized or arranged? And this is discourse structure. And finally, there is a question of how this level or layer is connected to other layers of the more general phenomenon. And this is discourse-based factors of smaller linguistic units or, or phenomena. For example, discourse factors of uh, lexical choice or uh, phonetic choices and so on and so forth. And uh, I think these uh, three central issues is a convenient way to organize the general linguistic theory of discourse. Now, um, um, if we want to um, employ a cognitive approach to the theory of discourse, then in accordance with the cognitive commitment, we have to use notions that are fundamental to human cognition and uh, are features of the human mind, such as knowledge, memory, consciousness, thought, decision-making, and I will be mentioning many more uh, further in my talk. Uh, so we need to connect uh, linguistic phenomena to these more general functions or processes that are characteristic of the human cognition. And these notions are independently grounded in cognitive literature, in psychology, in neuroscience. And we need to really need to coordinate what we think of them from the viewpoint of linguistics um, with what um, other researchers belonging to these other disciplines have already found out. Um, I want to emphasize the role of one linguist, a great thinker of our time, Wallace Chafe, the American linguist who was a pioneer of cognitive discourse analysis uh, for many decades, beginning from the 1970s. Uh, Chafe didn't, didn't use this particular label, but indeed he was um, doing what, what we can call cognitive discourse analysis because he was uh, doing systematic cognitively based st study of language. And that was started by him before cognitive linguistics as a paradigm was officially announced later on. And there is one quotation from Chafe who said that language and the mind are so interrelated that it would be futile to study one without studying the other. And um, yeah, the role of Chafe in the, in the formation of, of this uh, field that I am trying to sketch in this lecture is very important and I will be using many of his insights uh, further on. Oops, sorry. So um, my um, lecture will be organized in four sections. First, there will be three sections in which I offer a cognitive approach to three basic issues in discourse theory that I already mentioned before. Uh, in, the, in this, the following order, discourse structure, discourse-based decision-making on 
smaller linguistic unit, and also discourse taxonomy. And after that, I there will be another section in which I offer a kind of broader perspective and introduce what I call multi-channel communication. Uh, so discourse structure. Uh, there is a, on this slide, there is a general scheme of how discourse is organized. Of course, discourse is a very complex object. It uh, includes many uh, levels, many uh, intermediate uh, structures, but there is a top level that can be called global structures, some kind of, some kind of immediate constituents into which discourse as a whole can be split. Then, after many immediate layers, we reach the local structure. These are minimal, minimal units that belong to the level of discourse, minimal discourse units. And now I, I will only speak about local structure because you cannot fit everything into one lecture. Uh, so, local dis discourse structure is um, uh, in of what can be called from a more general cognitive perspective dynamic structure of behavior. Uh, like um, any uh, task-oriented and intentional behavior, human speech or discourse is structured. Uh, speech is produced in a constant flow, but in a stepwise fashion. And this observation has been made many times in, by different uh, researchers. And there, was, there were different terms, syntagm, intonation unit, prosodic unit, and so forth. And I personally prefer the term uh, elementary discourse unit, EDU, and uh, because it um, shows the uh, constructional role of these units in the discourse as a whole. And um, uh, EDUs uh, are identified on the basis of prosodic, uh, prosodic features, prosodic criteria including pausing, existence of a main accentual center, or what is sometimes called rheumatic accent, uh, existence of a holistic tonal pattern, a contour, uh, a particular tempo pattern, this is towards the end, and also loudness pattern. Also, uh, EDUs are coordinated with breathing, um, uh, our basic physiological need that we have as um, living organisms. Uh, here, there is an example, a Russian example. It's written both in Cyrillic letters and also in Roman transliter transliteration. And there is a translation given. Uh, it's an example from the so-called Night Dream Stories Corpus about which I will speak a bit later. Uh, and in this little piece of talk, the speaker said two EDUs. Uh, that uh, meant um, it's a story about uh, her night dream that she had. I got out from this coach and I enter into a fir tree. Uh, okay, um, and um, there is, uh, in this case, uh, there are boundary pauses at the beginning of each EDU, um, and there are no pauses inside EDUs. This is a uh, not a universal, but a very common pattern. Now, uh, each EDU has a main accent. Uh, it's on the first word in the first EDU and on the last word in the, uh, in the second EDU. And this is um, not just a prosodic phenomenon, but also a discourse semantic phenomenon. That's a, a informational center or ream of, of um, each of these EDUs. Then um, there is a um, acoustic analysis of these two EDUs in one of the programs specifically designed for this kind of analysis. And you can see uh, uh, the ellipses that, that indicate the accentual centers and there are uh, holistic contours in each of the EDUs starting from the some kind of basic level typical for the given speakers range of um, her voices F0 and then rising somewhat and then going to a 
uh, relatively low level, closer to, to the bottom of her range, F0 range. And also you can see the uh, tempo pattern, the final syllables uh, words in each EDU take longer than the initial ones. And this difference is very um, statistically very stable and very important. Okay. Uh, so these uh, kinds of prosodic criteria help us to identify EDUs with a fair degree of confidence. And uh, in fact, uh, I have made experiments with students who were offered uh, a piece of discourse in an unknown language. And after they were introduced to the notion of EDUs and the criteria, they were able to pretty, pretty well um, identify EDUs even not understanding a single word. So these patterns are really, um, really central and possibly even universal. It's interesting that um, the principles of EDU organization are, uh, have some very deep uh, neurophysiological roots. There is a study by um, the Russian neurophysiologist Konstantin Anokhin and his co-workers who are looking at um, a very different, very primitive from the linguistics perspective kind of behavior, the movements of uh, rodents uh, uh, around the cages where they were placed. It's a particular field of study in neurophysiology, the study of of the organization of movements of, of experimental animals. And it turns out that uh, these movements um, um, consist of individual segments that they call runs or spurts. These spurts are separated by short periods of standstill pauses. Each spurt starts with a period of high acceleration and uh, there is a deceleration towards the end. And also each spurt is directed towards a particular goal that is attained at the end. And that's similar to what uh, we call REAM in linguistics, the informational center. Uh, and so we see that the linguistic structure, the organization of discourse in, uh, as a sequence of EDUs, it's not, it's not a simply a linguistic phenomenon. It has um, uh, evolutionary uh, precursors um, uh, associated with the um, meaningful behavior of our distant uh, evolutionary relatives, uh, much simpler organism than ourselves. Uh, now, um, as was uh, found out by Chafe and other authors, EDUs appear uh, to not only be prosodic units, but they also have um, certain um, regularities in terms of their content. They, from the cognitive perspective, they represent what Chafe calls one focus of consciousness. Um, and uh, semantically, they re represent an event or a state. And uh, gr finally, grammatically, they uh, correlate with clauses. Uh, here you can see uh, a count uh, of, um, of a Russian corpus uh, from the point of view of um, Correlation between EDUs and clauses, and um, such correlation is observed in about two thirds of all instances. There are smaller EDUs. There is a smaller, uh, there is a um, kind of residue of larger EDUs. But this um, um, correlation is really is really strong, and similar figures are found in other languages as well. Uh, so we see that clause uh, is um, a well-known linguistic notion not the sentence, but a clause, a predicative structure, uh, is the kind of basic unit uh, of talk. But also it's a basic unit of knowledge representation, as we know. And uh, one can speculate that maybe uh, clauses in languages evolved uh, under the pressure of uh, very early and, and uh, fundamental uh, neurophysiological and cognitive causes. Uh, that is, proto-humans converging abilities of segmenting their own behavior in terms of behavioral acts and uh, segmenting reported experience. And um, when these two kinds of segmentation are aligned, we get what we see in modern 
languages uh, in uh, spoken discourse, okay? But what about sentence? Sentence is uh, potentially, <clears throat> potentially um, um, unlimited group of clauses, uh, usually one or several clauses, but um, sometimes uh, very long groups of clauses uh, that um, are well known from written text, but it's not immediately obvious uh, if they are um, if they exist in, in spoken discourse, which is the basic form of, of language use. And, and I believe that sentences can be, uh, can be identified in spoken discourse, but only uh, with the help of a sophisticated uh, procedure uh, based on criteria, criteria again. And that procedure involves a stage that can be called uh, building a prosodic portrait of a specific speaker, because we have to adjust our interpretation of sentence boundaries to the properties of the um, specific speaker's voice. Um, yeah, uh, at this point, I need to introduce the notion of phase that was offered by uh, the Russian linguist Sandro Kazasov, um, a phonetician and a general linguist who, um, suggested that phase is an abstract cognitive category or perhaps discourse semantic category uh, that um, has uh, several instantiations at different levels. In general, it means uh, the difference between something being non-final, uh, exp expecting a continuation and final conclusion of some kind of unit. And phase can be uh, identified at least at three hierarchical levels. First, there is elocutionary phase, difference, difference between a question, expectation of continuation versus statement, which is the end of something that the speaker offer, um, proposes. Interclausal phase, uh, sentence final versus sentence non-final, EDU, and the interclausal phase, difference between theme and dream. And uh, in terms of prosodic marking, um, phase is um, encoded with the help of, this, of the same, um, the same um, devices, uh, uh, tonal accents or pitch accents. And um, it, it's interesting that lower level phases are subordinate to higher level phases and there is mirror image marking of pitch in accent. Uh, let me give you a couple of examples. Th this is an example from a Russian corpus uh, in which the speaker, there is a transcript in, on the right hand side um, at the bottom of the slide right here. Uh, so you cannot, if you don't speak Russian, you don't, don't understand it, but roughly it means when I am 20 years old, you will only be 15. Okay, so there are two EDUs here. And uh, um, the second one is the um, end uh, of a spoken sentence. Uh, and it um, ends uh, with a falling pitch, um, pitch in the primary accent of this EDU, as you can see on this um, acoustic graph now. Then there is uh, interclausal phenomenon. Uh, the first, um, uh, yeah, um, uh, the, this um, uh, pitch accent uh, belongs to, um, to, um, to, to the in, in, is a kind of interclausal instantiation of phase. It's a non final EDU and uh, in anticipation of the falling pitch in the next EDU, this one has a uh, rising pitch. And, uh, uh, and finally, um, inside the EDU 16 right here, there is a theme that is uh, accented, it's right here. And it's a, a pronoun tibia, to you, which is kind of contrastive theme. And it's uh, again, bears a uh, rising pitch because it's adapted uh, in a mirror image way to the su subsequent fall in the rheumatic accent. 
this is how um, phase is organized at the level of prosody. Uh, this is a different example. It's an artificial example. Uh, I hope I can pronounce it more or less like uh, native speaker of English would do that. When John returns, will he call? When John returns, will he call? This is a yes no question. So it has a non final elocutionary phase uh, arise uh, at the end. And there is the interval phase, non final uh, phase on uh, uh, falling pitch on the word returns. And inside the first clause, there is an intraclausal, non final uh, phase uh, on the theme. Okay. So this is how this is how it's generally organized. Uh, now, uh, as for um, the boundaries of spoken sentences, it's very important to um, understand the difference between two kinds of falling pitch accents. Uh, as we already discussed, the final uh, falling pitch accent is a marker of a statement. Uh, and uh, the most common marker of, of um, uh, non-final uh, EDU is a um, rising pitch accent. But there are also non-final falling pitch accents that um, occur for a number of reasons, in particular because uh, of some kind of gradual uh, movement and anticipation of the final falling. Like in this example, again, it's a Russian, uh, a Russian example uh, that says uh, it consists of three EDUs, and these three EDUs mean uh, approximately they were eating cereal in the morning, uh, oatmeal at the table, and uh, uh, the target levels of F zero of the speaker's voice in these three EDUs are shown on the slide. And you see that the final falling uh, targets much lower level in uh, Hertz, indicated here in Hertz, compared to non-final um, non <clears throat> fallings. Uh, so if we um, take into account this kind of non-final fallings that are an important and uh, noticeable share among, among all EDUs, then we can establish, establish um, spoken sentences. Uh, yeah, there are other reasons for um, seeing non-final falling, such as anticipatory adaptive falling and insets, but uh, because of uh, time limitation, I don't illustrate this. Uh, generally, understanding non-final falling is a crucial point in understanding generally the phenomenon of spoken sentence. Uh, and sentence is a second order cognitive unit of local discourse. So uh, we can uh, recognize that sentences in uh, written language, they uh, are based on a, a phenomenon of sentence in, in, in speech. Um, and uh, it's important that we are able to identify um, the prototypes of uh, uh, well-known written sentences in, in spoken language. Uh, now, uh, to conclude this dynamic behavior, uh, there are uh, several uh, points uh, I, I need to make. Local discourse structure consists of identifiable behavior acts, elementary discourse units, EDUs. EDUs conform to fundamental physiological and cognitive constraints that chunk behavior, and they're also found in non-linguistic behavior. Uh, EDUs correlate with the basic linguistic unit uh, that we know for a long time, the clause. And uh, we can hypothesize that the human speech uh, is um, shaped um, by the coordination of two kinds of segmentation the quanta or segments of one's own behavior, EDUs established, established on, on the basis of behavioral criteria, and also the quanta or segments of reported uh, experience, uh, that is clauses. And uh, since clauses so central and crucial 
to the structure of languages, which is not, uh, as we know from, for example, syntactic studies, uh, we may uh, suggest that language might have evolved as a hyperstructure over proto-humans converging abilities of segmenting their own behavior and segmenting reported experience. Uh, while the notion of sentence, which is taken for granted by some linguistic theories, uh, especially those that are restricted to the verbal component alone, uh, is a prosody dependent uh, second order unit that, that is not as basic as an EDU and a, and a clause. Uh, yeah, that's um, all that I wanted to say now about uh, the topic of uh, local discourse structure. And now I proceed uh, with the following section, uh, discourse-based decision-making. Uh, as we um, produce our discourse, we constantly make a huge number of various choices, grammatical choices, finite versus non-finite predication. We make choices between tenses, between voices, active or passive, for example. We make tons of lexical choices using this or that word. In particular, we choose between various discourse markers, uh, for example, connectors between clauses. Mm, there is referential choice. It's um, indicated with color here because I will be talking about it in detail. There are all kinds of phonetic choices we make, for example, the level of reduction or all kinds of prosodic phenomena, such as tonal accents and so on and so forth. Uh, okay. Uh, several years ago, I uh, published this book, Reference and Discourse, um, in which I addressed theory of reference, typology of reference, and also uh, modeling studies of reference. and. Um, now, I won't speak, speak at all about typology, but I will briefly introduce theory of reference and uh, modeling study uh, because it's, um, it's the topic of uh, today's talk pretty well. So reference in discourse is one kind of uh, discourse, um, uh, discourse based, discourse influenced local uh, phenomenon. Um, it's um, reference is among the most basic cognitive operations performed by language users and also uh, referential expressions constitute a very large share of all information that is conveyed in uh, discourse. So it's an important issue. Uh, there are two uh, concepts. Um, first, reference as such means that at a certain point in, in my discourse, I want to mention, for example, Kant, the great German philosopher, as opposed, for example, Hegel, another great German philosopher. Uh, and um, so the reference is, is uh, a decision to mention a particular referent. And referential choice is another phenomenon. It's related, but it's different. So when I, my decision to make Kant is in place, I have to choose a particular referential expression. Uh, for example, a full noun phrase, such as a proper name, uh, perhaps a, a definite description, such as the great philosopher, uh, or as opposed to full noun phrases, I can use a reduced noun phrase, particularly a third person pronoun, such as he, or in some languages, that are, in some cases, a zero expression. Uh, and this kind of referential, referential choice is an instance of what is known in cognitive science as decision making. So we make all kinds of decisions every second as we unfold our uh, discourse. And uh, it's an interesting question, how we make this choice. Um, Um, there, so there are two different but related linguistic phenomena, reference and referential choice. You see two lines in this table. Uh, reference is a decision to mention a referent and referential choice is a decision on which referential experiment to deploy. And they are directly uh, linked uh, or they directly represent 
well-known cognitive phenomena that are much more general. They're not linguistic. They are observed not even in humans, but in all kinds of uh, animals. Um, um, and um, that these are um, uh, attention and working memory, respectively. Attention is a is, um, cognitive notion that means uh, selective processing of certain information to the exclusion of other information. We cannot process everything at the same time. So we have to choose what we attend to at this particular time. And um, in uh, linguistic terms, we have to choose what we talk about at this particular time, what we decide to mention now. Uh, working memory uh, is a different system uh, and it deals with a high level of activation of some kind of information allowing immediate access. We um, uh, cannot access everything at the same time. We have to concentrate on a small set of the most relevant uh, items that we need to be able to process very uh, rapidly. And uh, what, uh, what we activate um, is, um, is, very, uh, is changing very uh, quickly in time. So what we activate at moment n may be deactivated at moment n plus one and something else is activated, but I can also keep activation of a particular item for a while and so forth. Okay. Uh, referential choice is known to be a multi-factor phenomenon. Uh, there are many studies, linguistic studies that uh, tried to explain why we use full or reduced noun phrases. Uh, for example, distance to the antecedent uh, along the linear structure or hierarchical discourse structure, the role of antecedents such as a clause subject or uh, non uh, And these are uh, properties of the discourse context. Um, there are actually many more factors that I am able to fit into this slide. Also, there are uh, factors that are uh, associated not with the context, but with the properties of the referent as such, such as referent animacy or a referent uh, protagonist hood. And there is huge literature on these topics. Uh, yeah, at some point I proposed a quantitative model of referential choice that takes into account as many activation factors as possible. And such factors can be actually numerically assessed. And the sum of numerical contributions can be computed and uh, they produce what I call activation score of a referent. Uh, yeah, there is this uh, diagram in which you see two groups of factors that uh, influence the current uh, reference activation score, which in turns predefines referential choice. Uh, if activation is high, use a reduced noun phrase. If activation score is low, use a full noun phrase, more or less. Okay. Uh, the, um, this slide shows how this, this kind of quantitative model works. Um, each factor is variable with a number of uh, values. For example, distance to the antecedent may be one, two, three, and more. And then uh, each value to each value, we can attach a numerical weight. And these weights can be summed up and uh, activation score is computed. Okay. Uh, and I uh, start, uh, used this model to explain um, uh, referential choice in, in uh, two samples of discourse, one Russian and the other one English. And uh, um, this model worked well in the sense that all the instances were actually explained out, okay? And uh, that uh, gave rise to a kind of side study um, addressing more general issues in working memory as a human ability, general cognitive ability. The qu uh, two questions, the question of how many items working memory can hold at one time there is large literature on this. There is a so-called magic 
number seven that was proposed uh, some, time, some time ago. And there is also a question of control over working memory, how information gets into working memory. And in fact, these linguistic studies uh, help us um, contribute something to these classic questions of working memory. <clears throat> so for each referent, uh, activation score can be computed. And therefore, at any given moment, we can uh, calculate the grand activation of all referents. Uh, all references that are mentioned in the discourse at this point or in the vicinity. Uh, this, um, in this picture, light bulbs uh, show uh, varying degrees of activation of reference. Uh, the bulb on the right-hand side is maximally lit or activated, and the next uh, bulb to, to the left is completely inactive. And there are also intermediate level of activations. So we can sum it up and, and then uh, get what, what I call grand activation. And this um, diagram shows the dynamics of grand, uh, grand activation in, uh, uh, in an English study that I did uh, some time ago. And uh, the main result was that grand activation uh, never exceeded four, where one is the maximal activation on one particular reference. So uh, from this, we can infer that um, grand activation is um, limited um, to, to the interval between three and four. And that is different from the magic number seven that was known from the literature. And in fact, similar results were completely independently proposed by different studies in, in cognitive psychology. So I think this is a more realistic assessment of what the number of things we can think about uh, at the same time. We don't think about seven things at the same time. We can only think maximally about three to four items. Uh, now the question of control, as I mentioned before, uh, working memory is related to attention these two cognitive domains were studied completely independently for a long time in psychology. But then uh, later on, some studies that were bringing both into one picture started appearing. And uh, there was a suggestion by some authors that attention uh, controls working memory. Uh, for example, in one study, they said that attention can serve as a kind of gatekeeper for working memory. And I think that uh, conforms with what the discourse um, structure, di discourse phenomena tell us. Uh, in this table, there are um, three rows. Uh, there are moments of discourse, n and n plus one. And these moments are roughly elementary discourse units or clauses. Uh, if something is attended at moment n, it becomes uh, highly activated in the working memory at the next moment. Uh, that's what uh, psychology tells us. And linguistically, what is mentioned uh, in discourse at moment n in, or in edu number n, it um, is uh, uh, very likely reduced by, re, uh, re, redu uh, referred to by reduced form in the subsequent clause or, um, or um, edu. And uh, that's basically the, what is captured in linguistics by the phenomenon of, uh, of the relationship between an anaphore and antecedent, okay? Uh, this is one example um, of a text that is in one, in one um, project, uh, the story, a piece of text from a newspaper article. Uh, so there are three uh, moments or roughly clauses in this table. Uh, the, yeah, they are cited uh, in an abbreviated way in this uh, first row of this um, table. And in terms of attention, uh, in uh, clause number one, Ms. Johnson, Ms. Johnson is um, uh, attended to, uh, as well as uh, a certain house. And uh, um, at the next moment in time, uh, 
um, Ms. Johnson is already activated in working memory. Uh, she, she is referred to with the help of a pronoun because she was mentioned or attended in the previous clause. And in the third clause, there are two reduced expressions. Uh, Ms. Johnson is referred to by a pronoun again, and the workman is referred to with a zero form uh, because both of them were attended to in the previous moment of time and uh, mentioned uh, in the previous clause. Okay, that's roughly how this mechanics, so to speak, cognitive mechanics work. So to conclude this part on working memory, uh, we can generalize that the volume of working memory is limited to the number between three and four, uh, and information enters uh, working memory, the buffer of working memory under the control of attention. These results are obtained by a cognitive linguistic analysis of discourse samples and shed light upon uh, the more general debate on, on working memory organization. Okay. Uh, later, uh, together with a group of co-authors, we did a, a corpus-based modeling study. Uh, we researched a, a corpus of English texts, so-called RST discourse tree bank that was previously created by a group of uh, Marcoux in, uh, I think in Los Angeles. And uh, we developed our own annotation scheme for, for this corpus. And uh, there are some numerical information on the number of items in this corpus uh, that you can see. All right. And uh, we em employed the methods of machine learning to, to to, to, to explain and to account for referential choice. So uh, in contrast to the previous study that I discussed where every, everything was done by hand, there was some kind of uh, mathematical uh, calculation of activation score. Here, the um, previously constructed machine learning systems were used to, um, to um, provide a mapping between uh, factors and referential choice. And uh, we looked at two kinds of tasks. The two-way tasks task was a uh, choice between a full noun phrase and a pronoun. And the three-way task also included the difference between descriptions and proper names. And the one measure of, um, of um, machine learning success is so-called accuracy. Uh, which is the ratio of correct predictions to the overall number of instances, all right? Uh, so these are the results. And th there, was, there was a number of uh, machine learning, learning algorithms used. And uh, the one that is known as boosting uh, gave the best results, which are shown at the bottom, bottom of this table. So up almost 90% instances were accounted for with the help of this uh, system. Um, and uh, of course, a, a more, more modest result were achieved for the three-way task. Um, only, uh, now I will speak about the two-way uh, task um, that um, w was um, successful in about 90% of instances. Um, since um, the, this figure, 90%, is fairly high, but it's not um, extremely high. It's, uh, we don't reach 100% prediction. And there is a question, can we actually predict referential choice with uh, full certainty? Uh, there is some literature suggesting that um, referential choice may be not quite categorical. So there are some instances in which we can use both uh, for example, Kant and he, and both would be equally appropriate from a native user's, user's perspective. And if that's right, uh, then a model cannot possibly predict uh, referential choice with 100% accuracy. And uh, in order to test this um, hypothesis, we made an experiment and tried to find out whether uh, some of the algorithms prediction that were didn't conform to what was contained in the original texts 
whether they were acceptable to human language users. So we made a, an, an experiment uh, and um, basically to cut it short, uh, the idea was to see how native speakers of English comprehend texts with referential choices predicted by the algorithm, algorithm and different from the choices that were originally seen in the texts. And uh, um, yeah, th this is available as a, as a publication, so I won't uh, now concentrate on all details to save some time. The um, results uh, were as follows. All questions about the reference, no matter whether they were referred to exactly as in the original text or in a different way proposed by the algorithm, they were answered correctly um, to the same extent. So the, there was no st statistical difference between different experimental groups. And uh, generally it turned out that the divergent referential choices are as appropriate to human language users as the original ones. Um, so from this, uh, we conclude that uh, prediction accuracy um, doesn't approach 100% for a reason. Um, numerous instances, there are numerous instances in which referential options are equally appropriate. And uh, so many of the algorithms of failures to predict referential choice exactly as an, as an original text may be due not to errors, but to inherently not fully categorical nat nature of referential choice. So any realistic model of referential choice must include uh, um, some kind of degree of freedom. There, there, are, there is a category of instances uh, where deliberate choice is made between options, all right? Uh, and this can be illustrated with this diagram. There is a graded plane, cognitive plane, in which uh, referent activation varies from a minimal to a maximal value. Uh, at the linguistic plane, there is a binary var variable. You have to choose between a, either a full noun phrase or, or a pronoun. And when um, activation scores are extreme, there is no freedom. It's um, nearly automatically um, um, reflected in re referential choice. But when uh, activation is at the intermediate level, then the, uh, there are some instances of deliberate choice. You can use either a full noun phrase or a pronoun. And you just have to include this kind of generalization into your realistic model of how people uh, refer. Uh, to conclude this part on decision making, uh, um, I can say that referential choice is a typical example of decision making in discourse production. It's dependent on working memory uh, activation, uh, which in turn is, the, is dependent on multiple factors. Uh, referential choice can be explained by a quantitative model involving activation factors and, and activation score. Uh, and if we move to a more sophisticated methods such as machine learning, uh, high accuracy may be attained. But there is a residue that, is, that cannot be explained as a deterministic phenomenon. You have to postulate a category of cases um, that um, are not quite deterministic and not non-categorical. Um, and this kind of approach uh, to small scale choice, such as lexical choice between full and uh, reduced noun phrases, I believe it's, um, it has prospects for, for being applied to a wider range of other discourse based choices or decisions that we constantly make as well. Use this or that construction, use, excuse me, use this or that uh, lexeme, use this or that uh, phonetic uh, phenomenon and so on and so forth. Uh, the third, uh, the third um, major topic um, in um, discourse theory, um, I will only address very briefly, uh, not too much time is left, um, discourse taxonomy. Um, there are several most important taxonomies uh, or classifications of discourses. 
The first one is a classification between the spoken and written modes. There is a groundbreaking study by Chafe, 1982, who postulated uh, two basic contrasts between talk and writing, uh, in, including speed of processing and absence of presence of communicative contact. Uh, in uh, accordance with these um, two basic contrasts, uh, Chafe explored two corpora of spoken and written discourses and uh, discovered numerous differences between uh, particular, particular phenomena, such as syntactic complexity, use of passive, and so on and so forth, that are ultimately derived from the basic contrasts. Um, this is a very nice study, and uh, I recommend everybody to, to have a look at it. And um, I just don't have time to, <clears throat> to go into smaller details. Uh, apart from the spoken and written mode, uh, modes, there is also an internal mode. I can use language without talking. That's what the great uh, psychologist Vygotsky called inner speech. And um, we basically can speculate about this mode. We, don't, we have, don't have much positive knowledge about it. Another taxonomy is a taxonomy uh, of genres or types of discourse that we are using on this or other that occasion. <clears throat> they are based on uh, schemata, what um, the Dutch theorist of discourse, Tern van Dijk, called uh, called superstructures. Um, the mm, famous um, philosopher of language, Mikhail Bakhtin, used to say that one cannot use a language without knowing the proper genres, just as, as we cannot use language without knowing grammatical rules. And uh, it's um, important to, to mention that uh, genre schemata are, or, um, um, are uh, constitute an element of the offline realm in discourse because schemata are remembered. They're stored in long-term memory. And as we um, develop our communicative competence, we learn new genres. And if we don't know a particular genre, we cannot really talk uh, or write uh, in, a, the, in a corresponding situation. Uh, so it's um, also a very uh, basic taxonomy. Also, there is a taxonomy of functional styles that, that, that is domains of human experience. Every day, communication or learned academic, communication official, communication, and so on and so forth. And th there is an influential Russian school that was originally created by the Viktor Vinogradov that addressed this kind of phenomena. Um, I would like to mention a study I did together with uh, Vera Podleska and, my, and other uh, colleagues uh, some years ago. Uh, it's, a, it's a book about um, so-called Night Dream Stories Corpus. We were collecting stories by, we were analyzing stories by um, adolescents who were telling their night dreams um, after waking up and um, as a result, we created a kind of multi-purpose corpus of spoken Russian. Um, and um, um, this corpus is available at the website that is shown at the bottom of this, um, of this slide. Uh, the book not only includes the corpus and the system of discourse prescription, but also is a kind of cognitively oriented grammar of spoken Russian, which is very different from the normative grammars of of literary written uh, Russian that are um, um, widely available. Uh, okay. Also, uh, I would like to mention another corpus that can be um, um, that can be consulted at the same website, spokencorpora.ru. It's the parallel spoken written corpus. Um, and, the Chafe study I mentioned before, his study contrasting spoken and written uh, discourse, um, he used two corpora that were different not only in mode but also in functional style. 
because his written texts were not everyday written texts, but um, academic texts. So the effects that he observed were actually exaggerated. In order to, um, uh, to um, exactly discern the effects of mode on various linguistic phenomena, you have to balance such a corpus for uh, functional style. And that's what we did in the Funny Life Stories corpus. Uh, the same stories were first uh, told orally, orally by um, speakers. And then after a certain uh, amount of time, they were asked to write them down. So these are um, identical stories in terms of content, but very different in their form. And they're available to um, at this website and they are being used as a source of data for various control comparisons of talk and writing. Uh, now I would like to proceed with the fourth section of this lecture, um, dealing with uh, what I call multi-channel discourse. Of course, um, as um, is obvious to any user of language, but for some reason not to all linguists, uh, verbal structure is normally used in conjunction with prosody. Uh, we already spoke about prosody quite a bit, but also uh, non-vocal phenomena, kinetic phenomena, such as gestures, gaze, and so on and so forth. And that is um, this kind of range of phenomena um, are discussed in the vast literature uh, on multimodality. Uh, I cannot mention all relevant studies, but I just mentioned one handbook by edited by Muller uh, and others um, that is a very a very useful introduction to this field. Um, I prefer to speak not about uh, multimodal, but about multi-channel discourse, because we actually only deal with two modalities, not many modalities, uh, that is auditory and visual, whereas uh, channels are really multiple. As you can see on this uh, diagram, so, uh, now we mm, take into account two modalities, uh, auditory and visual from the um, addressers or producers perspective they can be called vocal and kinetic there are also other modalities but they are largely beyond the current picture and each of the modalities modalities is further broken into a number of channels there is the verbal and the prosodic channels in the vocal modality and in the kinetic modality there are you know, there is a gaze channel facial channels facial expressions cephalic channels, uh, head, head movements, uh, manual channels, um, hand gestures and some other movements performed by hands and arms, corpus channels, I can, for example, take certain postures of my corpus and change it and a whole body channel and also some other channels that may, may be considered in later studies, okay? So, uh, in order to illustrate uh, how important the channel is, I want to use an illustration from uh, David Crystal's lecture at the beginning of this series that took place in early May. Uh, let me move here. I, uh, yeah, so um, uh, on this slide, I, I tried to just to write down the words that he said during the short about 10 seconds period of time um, and i also added some uh, punctuation marks some capitalization periods uh, sentence boundaries um, in not in a very consistent way but somehow i captured what he was saying verbally and um, what David Crystal was talking about was the um, kind of supportive interruptions people permanent constantly do as they interact in conversation. Uh, so let me play to you uh, this 10 second interval and just pay, pay attention to his gaze and his head gestures and his hand gestures and, uh, and his prosody. Uh, so uh, pay attention to everything um, different from the verbal component. And you see it's very substantial uh, for his overall message. 
yes, I hadn't realized I hadn't made that point. People were responding very sympathetically. Now, I was surprised that there were so many positive, supportive interruptions. And okay, indeed, I as I said, hear and see that. Uh, so uh, my point here is that um, uh, lots, lots of information is conveyed in our regular face to face communication by things other than words. And uh, I can even fantasize that if linguistics were now designed from scratch, it would be natural to start with a prototypical multi-channel language use, uh, understand it in full, and then proceed with um, secondary kinds of language use, such as monomodal discourse, written discourse, literary or standardized discourse, and so forth. Uh, that's my fantasy, but the reality is very different. Uh, linguistics historically started with um, uh, quite the opposite um, uh, sequence of, of stages. And there is a fine book by the Swedish linguist Per Linnell, The Written Language Bias in Linguistics, that was published quite a while ago. Um, and um, um, Linguistics mostly addressed verbal only written and standardized language for a long time and only recently started looking at uh, uh, more, more natural, more basic phenomena. And this uh, may be compared to botanics based on the evidence coming from furniture, maybe even artisan furniture as this piece on the right. And um, uh, of course, some properties of wood um, may be preserved even in carpenters work so we can learn something about birch wood from this piece of furniture. But if you are interested in real trees, you probably have to go to the forest and observe as they grow from the ground. And that's what linguists doing multi-channel research are trying to do uh, at this point in time. Um, uh, there are dozens of different uh, research questions in multi-channel discourse. Mm, such as um, mm, understanding of communicative roles and turn taking, coordination of channels, what is um, how channels cooperate uh, with each other in conveying information, temporal alignment of behavior across channels, for example, EDUs and, and uh, hand gestures, how they are aligned with each other or more generally, whether they are aligned or not. Uh, recipients' attention to speakers' behavior, to what extent we notice speakers' gestures, for example, or maybe we ignore them. The relationships between prosody and gesture, uh, very substantial question of individual variation, what is general, what is uh, specific to a particular person, and many more. Uh, so I, I will only briefly speak about the two questions that are indicated with yellow color on this slide. Uh, okay. But uh, before I do that, um, I have to say that in order to address um, such questions systematically, one needs a well-organized and a sizable resource because um, we talk face to face to each other all the time, but it's, uh, ephemeral. It um, disappears being undocumented, so we have to um, document and record what we are doing. And um, in the Institute of Linguistics, uh, we were um, conducting a project called Languages Is for a number of years, and uh, we created a resource that can be employed for various multi-channel studies. It, it's an open source, source uh, resource. Everybody is welcome to use it. Uh, and um, what we did, we used the so-called pair film created by Chaif and his team back in the 1970s. Uh, perhaps you know the famous 1980 book, Pair Stories, that resulted from this project. So, um, film consists of a series of events, uh, of um, interactions between people, um, some physical events and so on. And, and this um, film has been used as a stimulus material in many studies and it's a very convenient um, convenient tool. 
So we <clears throat> tried to create, with the help of this film, to, to create a multi-channel resource approaching the actual richness of human discourse. And um, uh, that's how we did it. So there was um, uh, a series of sessions uh, in which, uh, in each of which there were four participants, three of them, the narrator and the reteller and the commentator um, were uh, participating from the very beginning. So uh, what happened first was the narrator and the commentator watched the film. Then the, they, the three um, participants came together and the narrator told the, the reteller about the contents of the film. Uh, that's what we call first telling. Then <coughs> commentator added details and all of them discussed the film. That was the stage of a free conversation. And then the listener joined the group and uh, the reteller who didn't see the film told the listener about the film, okay? And uh, that's called the retelling. And at the very end, the listener was supposed to write down the contents of the film. Uh, yeah, we used all kind of equipment, uh, frontal cameras, uh, um, wide, um, wide uh, angle cameras, uh, sound recorders, um, and individual frontal uh, cameras, we used um, high frequency recording, and um, which is very important for quick, quick kinetic events. And we also used eye tracking. Two of the participants were wearing, we wearing eye tracking glasses. Okay, so we made about 40 sessions uh, of this kind, each lasting on the average 20 minutes. Not all of it uh, has been processed. We are in the in, in the process of uh, still in the process of working on these media files and uh, uh, in the process of annotating them, but some of it is um, available on the website. Yeah, this is um, the team of the Languages in Project. And of course, I owe a lot to my colleagues who uh, can participated in this uh, study and, and keep participating in it, okay? Uh, so this is how the um, annotation looks like. So we use the well-known plan program. This is an example from uh, session number 22, uh, a piece where, uh, um, which is a conversation between the participants. And right here, you, you see the narrator, this young lady. Uh, this is a, a picture, a, a still frame from the individual front shot video. So this is a uh, frame from the eye tracker video. And this one is a frame from the cover shot video. Uh, at a particular moment in time, and everything of course is, is aligned and, and synchronized, okay? And there are various layers in this annotation. There is vocal annotation, there is ocular motor annotation, eye movements. There is cephalic annotation, head gestures, manual annotation, uh, hand and arms gestures. And uh, there, there is actually more than I can show you on this slide, but and all of that works as a, uh, works together in one complex. Okay. Um, now uh, the traditional assumptions about communication have been as follows: communication consists of verbal code. An act of communication is a message transmitted from an addresser to an addressee. The speaker is an addresser. The hearer is an addressee. Messages are sent back and forth between um, the speaker and the, uh, between X and Y, and they're te temporarily sequenced. And that's what, what is called turn-taking. And um, production and comprehension are um, traditionally seen as two separate um, independent processes. Uh, production is performed by the speaker and comprehension by the hearer, okay? And it's interesting to assess these, these claims against the reality of face-to-face multi-channel communication. This is just one example. Uh, one little piece lasting a few seconds, and you can see how much is happening during these few seconds, okay? So this is the narrator saying something. Uh, 
sorry, it seems the something's wrong and uh, the video wouldn't play. Uh, no problem. Okay. Um, so anyway, there are four videos on this uh, slide. In the first one, the narrator is shown. In the second one, the commentator. There is the cover shot video um, piece, and this is a video from the eye tracker uh, that the narrator is wearing. Um, okay. So uh, this is in the, uh, in the upper part of this slide, you can see the annotation. So what happens, um, there, there is a, a long series of events happening during the, this very brief period of time. So the narrator first says, uh, the boy was wearing, uh, the boy on the bicycle was wearing a, a hat. What did he? Um, and uh, you see that some short time after beginning this piece of talk, the narrator moves her uh, visual attention towards the commentator, looking for a kind of confirmation of her claim. You cannot see it because I cannot play the video, but just believe me, okay? Uh, a bit later, the reteller who already heard the, the first telling of the film explains, but he dropped it. Uh, and a bit, still a bit later, the commentator joins in, starts a gesture, a surprise gesture like this, uh, which uh, expresses uh, his surprise that the narrator forgot about the head falling. And uh, after a few milliseconds, he says, it fell off, okay? And uh, uh, still later, the, there is another turn by the narrator who says, oh, oh yes, that's correct. Uh, so you see six separate, very short events uh, that largely uh, overlap. There is a moment in time here that I show with this dotted uh, vertical line when uh, five different things happen at the same time. Uh, and uh, this is not the limit because uh, this is only partial illustration. I, I didn't show you all the channels of all of the participants. So when we communicate face to face, there is an incredible amount of processes happening um, simultaneously and unfolding in real time. And um, so, uh, we can say, if we take into account this kind of multi-channel communication, that the speaker uh, constantly tracks visually the hearer's be behavior. Uh, so an interlocutor simultaneously produces signal in one channel, for example, speaking, and receives signal in another ch channel, watching what the other person is doing. The speaker does this simultaneously an addressee uh, in communication. And the hero, of, of course, is an addresser at the same time, not only the recipient, but also the addresser. Um, uh, the, uh, um, uh, he, moreover, moreover, the hero may be an addressee not only in the vocal modality, but also in a variety of kinetic channels. So instead of uh, clear cut communication terms, as in the traditional uh, conceptual system, we observe multiple communication acts across various channels. In fact, channels conspire in building multi-channel terms and behaviors belonging to some channels intersect boundaries of multi-channel terms. Uh, all this lets us think about a complex ensemble of vocal and kinetic acts in which interlocutor, interlocutor simultaneously transmit signals in various directions. Uh, there are some related studies. Uh, there, they were done in a unimodal perspective, but still they are uh, cons kind of consonant with what uh, is suggested in our study. There is a study by Pickering and Garrett, uh, which they aim that production and comprehension, comprehension are interwoven. And that's important because that's what lets people predict each other. So when I am a, a producer, I kind of simulate internally the 
um, understanding process by, by my partner. And that helps me to predict how he or she will behave in the next moment of, of time. Also, there is a, a neurolinguistic study by Silbert and others uh, in which they um, looked at production and comprehension of narratives and um, they identified brain areas in which um, uh, were involved in speaking and listening. And they found that uh, the, um, the systems that are responsible for speaking and listening are strong, strongly intersect and overlap. Okay, so uh, we apparently need some kind of some kind of general theory uh, of uh, communication that uh, includes not only um, the verbal component but all, all of these channels and uh, their interplay. Uh, I was intending to um, discuss also the relationships between prosody and gesture. Uh, since I'm having these technical uh, problems with playing files, maybe I should uh, should skip this part. Generally, my point here is that uh, many multimodal studies uh, used to uh, fo focus on the comparison between the verbal uh, component and manual gestures. Uh, and uh, there are some similarities, but they are not great. So generally, the conclusion is that these are very different systems, but if we bring prosody into the picture, then uh, parallels between gestures and uh, and talk become much more obvious and much more numerous. And in particular, I demonstrated with the notion of velocity because there is the interesting literature on the on the iconic representation of velocity in prosody, and uh, I was able to find. Uh, same kind of uh, phenomena on, of velocity related phenomena in film. Uh, I'll try to play this. Uh, uh, so this is one, no, no, it wouldn't play. There, this is a slow iterative movement wiping a pair. And this is a rapid movement hitting the ball with a racket. And uh, there are um, systematic representations of these slow and rapid uh, movements uh, as um, slow and rapid uh, gestures respectively in, in retellings, uh, which shows that the velocity of gesture um, is iconically, uh, iconically represents the velocity of original events. Our velocity helps to find parallel phenomena in gesture. Uh, now, um, coming to my final conclusions, um, uh, we can say that we daily produce a huge amount of talk and writing. Uh, discourse is an uh, overt manifestation of our covert cognition. We don't easily see inside our brain, but we do a lot of small and large linguistic acts all the time. And, um, in order to understand um, how discourse is organized, it's useful to turn to general cognitive processes because it basically, as we, I was stressing from the very beginning, language and mind are very much inter interrelated. Uh, general cognitive processes such as knowledge, thought, memory, attention, consciousness, decision making, and many more that I mentioned in my talk and um, that are listed on this slide. And uh, um, on the other hand, conversely, human lang language and speech are a massive and still underrepresented, underestimated source of knowledge on general cognitive processes. Uh, there must be some kind of convergence of other disciplines in human mind. And uh, there is, um, inter of course, the interdisciplinary field of cognitive science that's been around for maybe more than half a century now, but I don't think that serious convergence happened already. It's still in the future. Um, different disciplines are still comp compartmentalized to a large degree. And in order to have such convergence, we need to, um, to apply some intellectual effort. In particular, it, it's important for linguists to drop the myth, myth of language autonomy, which is a very traditional view, of course. 
while psychologists and other cognitive scientists need to address linguistic facts seriously and uh, take into account what linguists can offer. Uh, and all part, part, parties need to open up their minds and, and, and be uh, re receptive to new, new information. And eventually, the, hopefully, that will lead some time to a more complete and better understanding of how the human mind works. Uh, this is a slide from, this is a, one of my Brazilian photographs. I, I by the way, wear today this t-shirt to commemorate my uh, very interesting trip to Brazil some years ago. And you can see here the beautiful Amazon River. And that's it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Andre Kibrek, for that uh, wonderful lecture. Uh, we, uh, could, uh, we could see here a lot of ideas for our work. Thank you very much. I will try to select the questions. Uh, but uh, but uh, if uh, we have no time, you, you can observe them at uh, the chat. Thank you for collaborating for, uh, for this project with so such much. a wonderful uh, contribution. Uh, the first question is, did you take in, in account other prosodic parameters in your analysis, such as final lengthening, uh, intensity, and pitch reset? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in fact, yes. Uh, I, of course, I didn't have time to go into all the details, and um, but um, but I briefly mentioned that in in, in our uh, website uh, spokencorpora.ru, we have a number of um, corpora of, of um, uh, Russian discourse. Unfortunately, unfortunately, the site is is. Um, in, in Russian only, uh, so unless you speak um, Russian and know Cyrillic, it's difficult to access it. But the other website, multidiscourse.ru, that I also mentioned, it's um, growing as a bilingual website, and uh, eventually we're going to have all the transcripts uh, in uh, um, English transliteration and with some kind of word-by-word -word translation. So it is, it's going to become uh, accessible to an international audience. And we do, we do um, use um, and take into account all the prosodic phenomena that you mentioned. In particular, final lengthening is uh, one of the most important criteria that help us to identify uh, this. Marcia, you uh, you have to turn on your uh, sound. Another question: yeah. Did you analyze spontaneous speech? If not, who do you expect to have different results? Um, yeah, uh, there is a wide scale um, of various corpus resources uh, from the point of view of their natural or artificial character and uh, uh, what spontaneous uh, speech um, just for example a regular dinner tape conversation would be at the extreme uh, pole of the scale of the pole of natu complete naturalness uh, whereas uh, experimental settings in which people utter some uh, short sentences or expressions would be at the extreme pole of um, artificiality. And our data, both uh, Night Dream Stories and um, the current um, pair chats and stories, corpora, uh, they are much closer towards the naturalness of this scale, but not quite. And the reason why we um, didn't, didn't um, make a corpus of a really spontaneous uh, conversation was for they were technical because for example if you want to have a high resolution video recording 
you have to you need a very good lighting system and that's already artificial if you put very strong projectors in a room lighting faces and hands of all the participants it's already a little bit of a lab like setting so uh, it's um, it's paradoxical but it's really difficult to capture completely spontaneous uh, communication in um, if you want to document it as um, as you know as it unfolds in real life uh, but we believe that uh, the compromise that we have the compromise between naturalness and the technical requirements that we have to conform to it's uh, reasonable and the material that we are analyzing is pretty close to a spontaneous conversation so we hope that we in this way we capture the most important regularities that are observed in, in natural discourse. Thank you. Uh, there is another question if, uh, by Alan Chunky. Can you comment on the structure yeah. of Edus as a more general movement pattern of animate beings? Example, the research by Anokin and et al. Uh, and how this relates to speakers' co-verbal behaviors. Uh, you know, there was some interruption in sound. Can you read it again, please? Okay. Can you comment on the structure of the edus uh, as a more general movement patterns of animate beings? Uh, for example, the research by Anoki et al. And how this relates to speakers' co-verbal behaviors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this um, this study by um, Anokin, and it, actually it's a whole trend in neurophysiology. There's a large number of research in different countries the, who spend their life, lives uh, looking at how mice run around the cages. It's uh, from our linguistic perspective, it's a bit strange activity, but that's what people are doing. So and it's very interesting. Um, and um, so what um, these regularities that they are, they are finding, I think they are really general, at least for mammals. So, uh, and then they describe the structure of, um, of elementary behavioral acts, whether they are vocal or kinetic and, uh, uh, and um, the, the, the basic structure with these uh, interruptions, uh, standstills in between, and the presence of a general trajectory or contour and the goal directedness, they are, they are uh, almost universal. So I think this applies to um, nonverbal to kinetic, uh, kinetic um, activity as well. Uh. There is a comment and a question. Uh, there is some evidence that the process of large units of information, such as discourse units, is related to certain regular brain waves, such as delta waves. What do you think about that? Well, uh, I, I read some literature uh, about that, but it was uh, several years ago I, I must say I'm not informed about the most recent um, um, advances and they, um, actually I'm right now planning a, um, a project together with colleagues who are uh, doing brain imaging uh, and who heard some <clears throat> some of the linguistic talks about discourse structure and want to figure out what happens, uh, what, what brain phenomena happen, happen at the boundaries between discourse units. And uh, I hope that we will have some um, interesting results, but it will be a while before, before that. That's probably as much as I can say about that right now. Thank you. Uh, another question from Mariana Gonçalves. Would you say that in relation to referential choice, uh, a speaker would also consider the knowledge shared uh, with a, the second speaker when make the decision? I think this is the, the, the address. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, can, can you read it one, one more time? 
please. Okay. Would you say that in relation to referential choice, a speaker would also uh, consider the knowledge shared mm -hmm. with the oh, yeah. second speaker when making oh, yeah. the, the choice? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, def most definitely. So, in fact, um, I, I even um, wrote about that in terms of uh, referential strategy, strategies. There are different strategies that we can assume. Um, one is, uh, one extreme strategy is, um, is an egocentric uh, strategy in which I assume that everything I'm thinking about is already in the mind of, mind of my partner. And that uh, happens with little children. For example, when they're t retelling a film, they're seeing he and she all the time without caring whether the listener knows who he or she is, okay? Uh, and um, that's related to our uh, ability known as theory of mind, which is underdeveloped in little children. Uh, and uh, on the other extreme, there is an overprotective strategy, and that's uh, what we often observed in, in uh, computational uh, language processing systems in which they, they uh, fear uh, reference and they keep using full expressions all the time as if assuming that uh, nothing can be known about the addresses. It's more safer to use full expressions on any occasion. And that's again, uh, very, very much uh, abnormal. So uh, the um, actual behavior of, of most speakers uh, is uh, somewhere between these extremes. The, there is what I call optimal strategy. When, when I, I make fair assumptions about what the, my partner is thinking about right now, and uh, I shouldn't, uh, I should not, neither uh, assume that his mind is blank, uh, nor that uh, he or she is exactly like myself. And so, and that's, that's an important component and that's related to what is uh, usually uh, ex uh, described as ambiguity, uh, referential ambiguity in the studies of reference. Uh, the, the languages have multiple resources and systems to, that help to tell apart different reference. For example, I might be speaking about uh, two references at a particular point, and if I'm speaking in English, uh, if they are both female, for example, using she would create uh, create ambiguity. But if they are of different gender, I may use he and she more freely without creating ambiguity. And the uh, command of this kind of uh, use is uh, directly dependent on my, my ability to, to model my partner in communication. So his or her mind must be somehow inside my mind in order to properly formulate my thoughts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, the last question, because of the time, is from is by is made by Leonor Vernek, professor at Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. Do you think that other aspects of discourse content, such as intentionality or other characteristics of the textual journal, can also influence the referential choice? Uh, uh, the word intentionality. Was and intentionality and, other, intentionality and yeah. other characteristics of the textual gender. Uh -huh. Yeah, there are some studies of uh, um, how referential choice depends on genre. Uh, for example, there is um, the American uh, corpus linguist Douglas Biber who wrote a lot about that, and um, he was comparing all kinds of uh, fine-grained linguistic characteristics, including referential choice and use of tense and the use of uh, voices and so on and so forth across different genres. And uh, the, the, there, there are definitely 
there are definitely some dependencies. And in our uh, um, uh, machine learning study, we also try to use um, genre as one of the potential factors. In the corpus that we were studying, we had about three, three genres, a new story, analytical story, and, um, and something else, a third one. So when we added this variable to our, to our um, system, we had a little rise in the pred predicting force of our machine learning system, about 1%. So even in that um, machine learning system that basically works as a black box, you don't know what's inside, how it makes decisions, there, there still, it still recognizes the importance of genre differences uh, upon very specific, very verbal um, phenomena such as such as referential choice. So that's that's a good question, uh, and the answer is yes. Thank you, Professor. Thank you for this rich uh, conference for with so many um, important ideas. Uh, I think I have to. Uh, to finish now, uh, I thank you all the team, uh, all uh, the Abraham team for this important uh, event, for uh, inviting Professor Andre Kibrick uh, for this live. I'm very glad to be here, uh, and I, I, uh, I. I would, I would like to emphasize that it is important that we promote the Abralin of Al Vivo because we have the opportunity to know a lot of important uh, researches around the world. Uh, to, to end this transmission, Professor uh, Andre, would you like to say some words in order? Before yeah, I, I just I just want to express my fascination with the Brazilian linguists who came up with this idea. It's a great idea in this uh, hard time when people are separated from each other. I feel like now we are more united than ever. So thank you so much. And thank you, Marcia, for taking the, the, the labor of, of uh, moderating the today's uh, lecture. I enjoyed it a lot. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Thank you so much.